guys how you doing welcome back to the podcast my fingers are cold <laughs> sorry anyway uh just wanted to stop in and do an episode episode 105 and i uh, hope you guys are all well i haven't done one since uh october 7th and uh we all know how the world's been going since then so uh i didn't want to add to any acrimony I didn't want to just do an hour-long rant, pissed off, so uh, I, <laughs> so I'll do it anyway now. But uh, I'm probably going to cap this whole project at 108 episodes. I think that's a nice Buddhist number to end on. But um, I'll uh, I'll stretch it out so that's like four left. And uh, I've appreciated all your support and the journey along the way. I just want to move on to other other things. I feel like there's so much noise out there. There's so much talking. There's not a lot of information being uh, transferred. You know, there's a lot of rage. You know, there's a lot of smart people doing the best they can to explain things. And there's a lot of grifters just trying to, you know, produce content all the time, right? Anybody who's on social media knows you're instantly like, congratulations, you reached a thousand more followers with your latest Instagram post. Do more. Like, that stuff to, starts to work on people's psyches, and they just constantly be, you know, want to put stuff out there. And then you get some stuff going on social media, and you figure out how to monetize it, and all of a sudden it's your job, and you're just adding to this cacophony, this mess of a world we're in now, without, in my opinion, offering any light or peace or insight and you know I don't want to make anything harder for anybody and I'm, I'm not saying that you know I offer all those things I certainly don't but I don't want to continue you know continue to make it worse sort of so that's my take on it so you know I'll figure something else out in terms of content as you know I don't I don't do this for a job I appreciate the people who bought the t-shirts and stuff but I never went with a you know, a paid subscription thing on here. And I do the Substack, and there is an option to, to sign up for that. And I'm grateful to the people that have both paid and unpaid. You get the same content either way. But, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about. We can work backwards, you know, from yesterday. I also, I just, you know, I don't want to talk about Trump anymore. He's winning, you know. I hate to say it, but when, when he... When he gets back into office next year, which he very well may, and you should be aware of that. Don't get Pollyanna-ish about this, okay? He is very popular right now. For what he has done to this country, for the kind of person he is, for the caliber of human being he is, to have so much popularity, to have, to have such a hold over the American psyche, and to be existing in a time where so many people are willing to be swayed along those lines. You know, even if you make the argument that it's only a third of the country that's really supporting of him, there's another bunch of people that just don't want to get involved and they're going to kind of sway the way, you know, they're going to bend the way the wind blows when it comes to election time and their communities are going to reinforce, you know, Trump is the way to go, you know. And 
there's a, you know, the last two and a half years of me doing this podcast was basically me trying to explain some of that stuff, you know, the cultural way that sort of white folks in the suburbs get cowed into, you know, thinking this guy's for the cops and the firemen and the, the he loves our vets, <laughs> you know, he doesn't, right? Yesterday was Veterans Day. He called them suckers and losers, you know, he, he threatened to disown Don Jr. when Don was going to join the Marines. You know, but there's negative partisanship, right? Negative partisanship means you're not voting so much that you like him, it's that you hate the other people so much, right? You can't stand the other guy. And obviously, Biden is incredibly unpopular. Why? I really don't know. But people seem to have a lot of animosity towards him, besides the age issue, which they've clearly turned into an actual thing, even though Trump's three years younger, you know, and hasn't you know, he gets winded walking upstairs. He asked for a golf cart to get out of his SUV and go 50 yards into the Museum of Natural History. Literally wanted a golf cart so he didn't have to walk. So uh, it's my point is he's not some, you know, picture of youth. But um, the negative partisanship thing, I saw this thing on Facebook but from somebody I went to high school with, you know, probably a month and a half or so ago. And it's haunted me ever since. And it was one of these form letters that get sent around on Facebook. I'm sure you've seen them. They're like, hey, just sending this out for any man who wants to reach out to another man and let him know you're there because I'd rather take a call at three in the morning than go to your funeral. That kind of stuff is positive, right? But those sort of form letters, you know, I'd like to see how many people will copy and paste this so I know how many good, you know, that kind of mind, hive mind, uh, you know, down home philosophy kind of shit like it gets very popular on the internet so i saw one i don't know if this person cut and pasted it herself or she found it i i su suspect that she found it from somebody else because it was a lot of words and it, the fact that she reposted it shows me she's probably not very intelligent <laughs> so i don't think she was even capable of formulating the whole thing but it basically was paragraph after paragraph of like we don't care what trump did we hate you guys so much because you attacked our cops and our beloved vets and you want to indoctrinate our kids into being, you know, transgender and you want to take away our guns and our liberties and you hate freedom. You know, all the pablum that Fox News and the Republican Party have shoveled into the mouths of the malcontented, mediocre, suburban white people for 40 years almost, right, ever since Carter came along. The, you know, the think tanks in D.C., the conservative think tanks, had to find a way to counter the progressivism, right? And Reagan was the perfect foil in the beginning, you know, this cowboy actor who seemed like a good dude. He was really just a racist moron who was already suffering from, you know, Alzheimer's by his second term. And they kept him a secret, kept it a secret, gave him a, you know, gave him a jar of jelly beans and, you know, prosecuted wars in Central America, invaded, you know, sovereign countries that we'd always screwed with and you know sold drugs to you know to pay for it through the cia and did all this crazy stuff where while the gipper you know was sitting back in his bedrooms you know not knowing what day it was right so but it was effective right and and i've talked about it many times my generation you know grew up in that i was in high school in those years and people i went to high school with loved that shit. you know they ate it up and liberal became a bad word you know you had uh what's his name in the south you know the political strategist i've talked about him before he died a long time ago i can't remember his name it's not really worth remembering him because he was an awful person but uh, lee atwater you know lee atwater sort of was one of those guys who came up with that southern strategy to sort of take back you know, take back power from the Democrats who'd always had support amongst sort of salt of the earth working people, union laborers, you know, recent immigrants, people who knew, you know, they were going to benefit from sort of a new deal, social democratic kind of environment, right? That was welcoming and you could, you could get a leg up, right? It was easier to take away that power and convince people that what they really needed was guns and a free market economy, 
you know, and this cowboy was going to give it to you. And of course, what did Reagan do? He closed down all the factories. He let Wall Street go unregulated, you know, and they stripped all these companies, shipped production overseas and created a, a rust belt, you know, and they, you know, they deregulated mental institutions and, you know, lots of public health situations. And of course, the arts, because the arts, as I've said many times, helps people become in touch with their own humanity, which allows you to understand other people better and uh, other cultures, and it makes you a richer, smarter, more effective human being, which is not what the Republican Party is looking for in a voter. They're looking for people to, to vote on their aggrievement and their anger, right? So you had those Reagan years, and then in the 90s, you know, Rupert Murdoch saw there was, there was a lot of money getting left on the table with the NASCAR NFL crowd, you know, not that everybody who enjoys either of those pastimes, you know, is a racist or whatever, but he saw the demo that wasn't being served by CNN and he created Fox News. And even Fox News in the beginning it was, was not what it is now. Like they used to kind of have news on there, you know, and they had Alan Combs. They would have a foil for their rhetoric. Now it's just smarmy frat boys, you know, saying whatever kind of crap they want to say. And and that was effective, right? And that was over 20 years ago. You know, that's 30 years ago now. So what happened is all of that is sort of coalesced into Trump and MAGA in 2016, you know, and, and the cultural phenomena that had him elected, which was people's misogyny against Hillary Clinton, right? Because they'd been trained to hate her since she came into office too. And lots of women turned against her. I was with Graham Nash down at an airport a couple weeks before the election, and I heard these wealthy white women, you know, they appeared to be wealthy. It was a fancy part of Florida. We were going to do some corporate gig at a, uh, it was Naples. And, uh, you know, they were waiting for their fancy to me luggage, and they were talking about the election, and they're like, well, we can't vote for Hillary. Yeah, no, I don't like her. Well, I guess we'll vote for Trump. At least he'll be funny, right? At least it'll be entertaining. That was their words, you know? They thought it was gonna be entertaining to elect this guy, this misogynistic sexual predator who had bankrupted every company he ever started, who blew his dad's inheritance, who wanted to bang his daughter ever since she was nine years old, you know, and would get surrogates <laughs> to, to, to satisfy his desires, as I've told you. You know, that's what his beauty pageants were all about. That's what all the girls who worked in the White House were all 20 years old, you know. John Mac McEntee, have you read about him? He, he became Trump's body man in the White House towards the end, and he, he ran the Office of Personnel, and he's one of the guys that Trump wants to reinstate if he gets back into office in Project 2025. But one of this guy's side gigs was to, like, get the hottest chicks he could. You know, so I don't mean chicks. It's disrespectful. I'm sort of, I'm speaking in their, uh, <laughs> their, their tone. But, um, you know, he'd get all these young girls from Ole Miss and stuff, and Ivanka would hire those type of, of girls, and and this guy would only hire dorky guys so he would have a better shot at, you know, a conquest with all of these hires, and that's kind of who Trump is, you know, just like a scumbag scumbag. I don't need to relitigate all that, but that's who he surrounds himself with. So the fact that women, you know, were willing to sort of look the other way or give him a chance because of some fucking hatred of Hillary Clinton still pisses me off because she was supremely qualified for that job, okay? And the COVID pandemic would not have been as bad if she were in office. You know, we wouldn't have pulled out of, you know, probably Afghanistan in, in, the, in the same way we did because she was Secretary of State. And she understood that. We certainly wouldn't have, like, you know, pulled out of Syria and screwed over the Kurds like Trump did. You know, people that fought alongside us got slaughtered overnight, and we gave our bases to the Russians, right, overnight because Trump wanted to pull out of there because it benefited Putin. Right. So Veterans Day yesterday, he's talking about all this stuff and he says that the far left are vermin. He uses these words that have only been used in historical context context by Nazis. That's the only time they've come up. And he says the real threat to the U.S. is from within, is from the far left extremists. And we're going to eradicate this vermin. You know, 
that's straight up Nazi stuff. And Trump is a Nazi. He's idolized that. His dad idolized it, you know. So that that should that should scare the hell out of anybody who's listening to this podcast, you know. The fact that we're even this close to this, you know, and, and I get like vote. I want Biden to win. I'm going to do all I can to educate everybody I can, you know, come in contact with in the next year of the dangers of reinstating Trump. But I'm not going to do it for entertainment. I'm not going to do it for clicks. I'm not going to do it to build my brand. And there's plenty of other people out there that'll that'll take your attention if that's what you want to do. I'm going to try to drill down deep and see what's at the heart of this rot that we have in people's consciousness that's allowing this to happen. You know, the fact that Trump could say that to cheers on Veterans Day, you know, that, and that's without, you know, rehashing all of the other insults he's given to vets through the years. Not to mention we're at a time of, of essentially war. You know, we're, we're in a more precarious position than we've ever been in my lifetime in global, you know, affairs. And my grandfather worked for the NSA. He was, you know, stationed in Saudi Arabia. My family was in Munich in 72. They were overseas. He worked with Israeli intelligence. You know, just just the forget about all the other issues around the Israeli-Palestinian context and the complete lack of history that's being displayed by many on the left. You know, I feel bad, too, about what's happening. I do not believe they should be dropping 2,000 pound bombs on buildings. I think they should have come come in on the ground from the beginning. They ha but they're in every right, you know, they have every right to defend themselves. But, you know, this sort of TikTok trend of having misinformation, of not understanding even the Oslo Accords, you know, even that there was a Nobel Peace Prize given out to Arafat and Shimon Peres and Itzhak Rabin in 93, that we were close to peace, right? And then a radical extremist in Israel, a far-right guy in Israel, far-right, killed Rabin, right? And then they blamed Shimon Peres, right? And then they went after the bomb maker in Palestine, or Gaza rather, you know, the famous bomb maker guy that Yasser Arafat said wasn't in Gaza, and he was, and the Israelis went and killed him, and Hamas made him a martyr, and they took over the mosques, and they got extreme, and they gave out grain and free food to the people, so they sort of took over their minds to some extent, some of them. Many of them opposed it, but if you opposed it, you ended up dead. If you were gay, you got thrown off the top of a roof, <laughs> you know? There was no room for subtlety or freedom in this, you know, terrorist dogma that somehow kids on the left think it's totally hip to go out and tear down posters of kidnap victims of you know young people that were their age that were raped and murdered you know in god-awful ways they were killing grandmas and live streaming it and somehow every woke college kid in the country now thinks they're some freedom fighters you know and then you have more extreme kind of dumbass for lack of a better word intellectuals making the same kind of arguments they've been making for decades because it's always been a hip thing on the left you know the Free Palestine Movement was smart, and then they showed up at protests, you know, starting around like the Michael Brown stuff in, in, outside of St. Louis. They'd show up at Standing Rock. They, they would get tables, and they sort of equated their cause with the struggle of indigenous people and the, the struggle of minorities against sort of white oppressors. And they were able to be reductive to the extent that they they've sold this issue to a new generation as if it's just white colonizers penalizing, you know, and, and suppressing, you know, indigenous people, which is bullshit because like almost, you know, 5 million of the 10 million people who live in Israel are from the Mideast. They're called Mizrahis. They come from, you know, from Iraq all the way down to Ethiopia, right? There's all kinds of Jews that are non-white, <laughs> you know? They're not just... But the, these, these kind of oversimplified dunces that are walking around now thinking it's all just like everybody just came there, you know, after World War II and just started, you know, putting the man, you know, they were the man and they were just putting down, you know, these people who just want to live in peace is just completely bullshit. And it ignores the complexity and the reality of the situation. And that's not to say there hasn't been, you know, an uneven equation the whole time. And that's not to say there hasn't been a lot of suffering. 
you know, in Gaza. And, and that's not to say there hasn't been a lot of transgressions from Israel, from the far right party. You know, after I talked about Hamas taking power in Gaza, they got rid of Perez and they had the Likud party and they had Netanyahu, who's a Trump. He's Trump. Okay, they got a head, they got a 20 year head start, right? Since the 90s, they got their own far right guy, who's the last guy who should be prosecuting this war. My fear from the beginning, and I understand why Biden went there and gave him a bear hug and stood with him, America has to stand with our democratic ally in the Mideast. It has to stand with Israel. Israel has to survive, you know? If you want this world to be the world that, you know, you've been so privileged to live in and, you know, and, and protest on your college campuses, strategically, you need it to be there. Trust me on that, you know, or, or better yet, go do your own, you know, learning, not research on TikTok, but read some history books, right? But my fear from the beginning was that Netanyahu would screw over Biden because he knows, you know, Trump's his buddy, right? He used to sleep at Kushner's house. Charles Kushner and Bibi Netanyahu go way back. They've done tons of business together. He knows that the firestorm that's getting kicked up on the left is going to hurt Biden, right? And that's why he didn't listen to Biden's entreaties like, hey, Let's have a ceasefire. Let's have a humanitarian pause, right? They're doing four hours a day, but that, that bombing campaign should have been tamped down, you know, weeks ago, and it hasn't been, you know? And, and I think that's the political equation from Netanyahu is saying, what's he going to do about it? Biden's not going to be here in a year, and I'm only going to help my boy get back into office, and then I get to be the dictator of Israel, and, you know, Trump gets to be the dictator of the U.S., and Putin gets to pay us both out of the, you know, out of his, you know, backdoor Iran, you know, cutouts and stuff. So it's, it's, it's horrifying and it's scary and it's a lot to talk about. And a lot of it is being misconstrued in a way that's very dangerous. And a lot of people seem to be failing to see the big picture. They seem to be not aware of how they were playing into the hands of the people that would do them harm. And I'm not saying it in a binary Israeli Palestinian, you know, Gaza kind of way. I'm talking about a big picture weakening of democracy. That's what's trying to happen. You know, that's what they're trying to make happen. That's why millions of Israelis were in the streets for months since the spring showing up to protest, putting us to shame. We weren't protesting much during, you know, Trump's years. Black Lives Matter, yeah, you know. But we weren't marching on Washington all the time. Those guys were in the streets every night when he tried to get rid of the judges and stuff. You know, when he tried to consolidate power, they were like, no, we want a democracy. We'll fight for it. And then they got viciously, viciously attacked, right? Because Netanyahu stopped paying attention to the security, you know, along that part of, of Gaza and, and focused on the West Bank and his far right settlers who, who have no business to be there. They're the bad guys on the Israeli side, the instigators, you know, they're, they're the Israeli equivalents of your MAGA guys, you know, with your big pickup trucks and your AR-15s and they're murdering Palestinians now, you know, and he's not stopping it. He needs to stop that right away, you know, because it's all so incendiary, you know, and, and there's human beings that are losing their lives every moment, you know, and, you know, there's so much pain and there's so many horrific feelings and, and I'd never witnessed anything like w what I saw. You know, I did this podcast about a couple hours after it happened, you know, that morning and, and I assumed when I went online, everybody would just be talking about the horror that we were witnessing. I mean, I saw things I never thought I'd see. I saw dead babies. You know, I, I've seen, I've seen horror to the point that I'm, I'm barely online. None of my, I'm not barely online. I'm getting off, but you know, none of my replies are open because I don't want people posting propaganda, you know, but instantly my point is I thought people would be really like shocked and horrified. And that would be the conversation for a couple of days. It wasn't as soon as, as somebody posted, like, I can't believe, you know, what happened to these people in these kibbutzes or whatever, or these kids that were hiding in a bomb shelter and they threw in a hand grenade and shot them all and stuff, you know, or kidnapped these young women and took them to Gaza, 
you know, or murdered them, right? While little kids came out and spat on their naked bodies and cheered. You know, you think there would be some discussion about that, but no, it was instantly like, hey, they're freedom fighters. Israel had it coming. And those kind of trolls are out in force. And they're not just trolls. Most of them are probably part of an engineered bot farm kind of situation that probably Putin is behind because it's so destabilizing to American interest and democracy as we are seeing, you know. But they were there right away. It was an inhospitable situation right away. And then just the good old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Not that anything's good about it, but it's the oldest form of sort of prejudice that everybody seems to want to get their licks in on. And that's what happened right away. I had no idea how anti-Semitic things have gotten. And I've talked about anti-Semitism and written about it a lot <laughs> since Trump came into office because he's extremely anti-Semitic. And that was quite obvious when you worked around him. You know, Jared was referred to as the Jew, okay? He makes jokes all the time about Jews counting his money, you know? He's an asshole, right? And as I've said before, he comes from that old school New York, you know, hates Puerto Ricans, you know, hates Jews, hates blacks, white Christian males, Nazis, purebreds. That's who should rule the world, and that's what he's asking for. And a lot of dumbasses in this country are going to sign right up for it. You know, and the anti-Semitism is going to play into that. And you want to talk about Veterans Day, right? How many of those people in a graveyard in Normandy or in Arlington, you know, or in Italy died fighting to protect democracy, you know, to, to, to try to liberate and save the Jewish people that were being slaughtered by a maniac who was using them as an excuse to gain power, as so many bad actors have done throughout history. Go to a museum. You know, I was at the Rijksmuseum this summer. Go look at Rembrandt's. Go look at, like, great art, Vermeer's and stuff. Walk through a, a classical museum and tell me, how many, tell me how many pictures you find where they have a, a Jewish character, it's usually the tax collector or somebody getting some money pictured in the painting, depicted in the painting, and he's got a big nose, kind of an evil-looking face, you know, scowling over somebody's shoulder. You see it all the time, you know? Anti-Semitism is the oldest game in the idiot's playbook because, you know, it makes people feel like there's some other that's destroying their lives or working against them, you know, some international cabal, you know, because a lot of people get resentful. Right? They, get, they don't understand. Well, well, how come Jewish people are so smart and rich? <laughs> you know? Because they value education. Because they have very strong families and they make sure their children are educated. You know? And then they go into professional careers in many cases. They also just end up being like everybody else because there's really no difference, right? But from a cultural standpoint, what is reinforced is something that makes you stronger and, 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 and better in the world in many ways. And I think that is, is also being used against Israel in this moment, right? Because you look at, you know, you look at Gaza and you're like, well, how come they're all poor and, and, and the Israelis are living in this first world like rich life? Well, a lot of that is, is not just the circumstance, which, which they definitely need a two-state solution. Many Israelis believe that, especially the Israelis that were murdered, okay? They were murdering the, the peaceniks, the hippies, the guys that were living on kibbutzes, working in an agrarian society. They were murdering the kids that were dancing under the stars for peace, right? So it's not like all Israelis want to just make, you know, Palestinians suffer. That's not the case. Yes, the far right does, because they're assholes, right? Netanyahu, okay? Who, who were the people in America who showed up in the civil rights movement? They were Jewish college students who went down to the South and started marching alongside African Americans that were looking, you know, to start the civil rights movement, which didn't even begin to happen in full force until the 60s, which is completely nuts to begin with, right? Who was the guy who went down there and wrote folk songs on the back of a flatbed truck? while people were still working in fields like sharecroppers, you know, 
Jim Crow era, barely out of enslaving people economic conditions. Who was down there writing songs about it and then bringing them back to coffee houses in Boston? Bob Dylan, Robert Zimmerman, you know, a Jewish guy. So to see everybody turn against them, what, what, to have it feel like everybody is turning against them. And I see a lot of it in sort of black intellectual thought. You know, there's this guy who taught at Temple. I think it was Temple. He's like, uh, he got fired at CNN for saying something anti-Semitic a couple years ago at a speech at the UN. Mark Lamont Hill is his name. And I saw him on The Breakfast Club, which is Charlemagne the God. It's very popular you know, morning show, very influential in the hip hop community. And they were talking about the attacks and somebody, you know, said terrorism. And he said, let's be careful who we call terrorists, you know, because Nelson Mandela was labeled a terrorist, you know, up until 2008 or whatever. And there is a technical technicality where he was, but you're equating, you're equating Nelson Mandela with Hamas with people who strap bombs onto children and send them over the border to get on a bus and blow people up? Are you out of your freaking mind? But it became hip to talk that way, you know? A long time ago, I was around it. I've seen it, you know? I was the road manager for Bad Dog, John Trudell. Like, I was Jackson Brown's acolyte, his road manager. I grew up on the far left. I grew up going to Pete Seeger Clearwater concerts, <laughs> you know? I, I, I'm all for sticking it to the man and stopping American imperialism, but this ain't it, okay? Hamas ain't Bob Marley, and life is a lot more complicated than a Rage Against the Machine song, you know? But it became very hip, especially with educated people on college campuses and college professors to sort of foist this philosophy on, on their students and on the culture. And at the heart of it is complete bullshit that doesn't take in the complexities of the issue. It just doesn't. It's historically inaccurate dogma. And it's super effective because, yeah, they got a cool looking flag. It's red and brown and, you know, red and black and green or whatever. Kind of feels Jamaican ish. You know, like I get why it took off, but it's dangerous now. And that's not to say. We don't need peace and a solution for the Palestinians. We absolutely do. You're not going to get it this way. You're not going to get it by increasing the rancor and the division. What you're going to get is a Trump in power. You know What you're going to get are men that are going to use those emotions and this injustice and this violence for their benefit to get a hold on power. And then it's going to be all over. You know, then you're not going to get it back. You're not going to get to vote again. See, I voted last week. I put that sticker up there, you know, because it might be the second to last time I get to vote. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be alarmist for no reason, okay? But I'm not going to BS you and just be like, yeah, everything's hunky-dory. Don't pay attention to the polls that came out last week that showed Trump had a lead in six swing states. You know, everything but Wisconsin, I guess, five or six, you know? Yeah, those, those polls are not the be-all and end-all. You know, they're, they're not reason to panic, but they shouldn't be disregarded, you know? And a lot of the professional sort of punditry class likes to disregard them. A lot of the, you know, political operat operatives and the people who have the PACs and the young people, a lot of the people that I've been involved with and been in the warms, war rooms with, you know, online, the people I met at the White House when they had the progressive influencers come down, you know, all those people like to disregard it because the whole gig is like, yeah, yeah, vote blue. All right, check out our new video. We're taking back democracy. Help us fight back. Sign up so you don't miss a single tweet, you know, and also send us 15 bucks every month so we can keep fighting back. Well, if you're fighting so hard, how come Trump's still in power, <laughs> you know, or, or about to reclaim power? How come he's so popular? You know, it's not to say all of that is bad, but it's like I said last week, and I get if you take offense to that. If you enjoy watching these people, go watch them. Go, go, go to Mary Trump's shows and buy her podcast or whatever the hell it is, you know? But don't kid yourself that you're making a difference if you're doing something online only, because you're not. You're not making a difference because it hasn't shifted. Biden is still incredibly unpopular, which is nuts, because the guy's accomplished a lot given the situation he's in, and he's leading from empathy. 
You know, he's coming at it the way a fully formed human comes at things, you know, with an open heart and understanding the human suffering, you know, at the heart of it all. And I, when I was down at the White House last October, as I've said every time I could on this show, because for me it was a proud moment being a kid who grew up outside of D.C. who would take tours of the White House in my elementary school that they bust us into from my poor neighborhood where I lived with my single mom. And my best friend's name was Abdullah Ghanem, who was a Palestinian refugee along with his family and his cousins who took up four apartments in our little complex. And I slept over his house pretty much every night. And we watched Bruce Lee movies and ate cereal, you know, and then later listened to Iron Maiden together. And his dad, you know, was a driver in, in D.C. and his mom was a hairdresser, Frida, and Big Al. Albert was his dad, Abdullah, you know. We would get, you know, we'd go on school trips to D.C., you know. So when I got to go there, I understood in my life, in my journey, what it meant to just have an opportunity to maybe make a difference. But to now, to see what, the way things are shifting, the way people are turning, you know, on, on their fellow Americans is insane. Like, how are you being like this? You know, I don't think I, I and I'm the biggest problem is if you try to speak on it now, you'll instantly being attacked as to not care about the Palestinians. And, and I'm a guy who's told all the Jewish people I love my whole life. I've been that obnoxious guy. Like, what about the Palestinians? But what about this? But this is wrong. Like, I'm always every chance I get trying to bring that stuff up. And I'm also the guy who gets to go to, you know, high holidays with the Jewish people in my life that I love, you know, who gets to. To, to listen to, you know, you know, the Park Avenue Synagogue, you know, Rosh Hashanah, like, speeches and all these things that I've been privileged to do. Because every, the people that don't know my personal life, but every serious girlfriend I've had has been Jewish. And it's, there's three in my whole life that were most consequential. And why that matters is because their families helped me in ways that, that I could never repay. You know, it wasn't just like you were dating the girl and the family didn't like you. And a lot of them had no reason to like me, even when I was younger, you know. They were from these smart, accomplished, you know, Jewish families. And, and you know, their daughter brings me home, you know, in 1995. Like, how would you feel, you know? Your daughter just went to Ivy League school and then she brings home, you know, grunge boy who wants to be an actor, right? But they didn't turn their backs on me. I needed some help and they helped me. You know, I've had sort of surrogate Jewish, Jewish mothers in my entire life that have helped make me the man I am, you know, and, and fathers. Because I've, I've seen the, the, these, these, these families and these dynamics of, of strength that's been forged in opposition, right? The same thing I would see that with my Palestinian friends when I was younger. You know, it, that's the message I'm always trying to talk about. Like, the more you're exposed to other cultures, you know, or, or, or all my black friends and all my black coworkers and all the, you know, all the people who made me who I am don't look like me, but their family just the same, you know? And, and their differences, their ideologies in terms of religions or cultures or whatever, those flavors will only make you stronger, as I always say. But you got to come at it from the right way, you know, and coming at it by repeating dogma that's hurting the Palestinians. The Palestinians are dying, okay, because Hamas built tunnels underneath the city and takes all the money and all the aid and puts it into those tunnels to building them. They keep the oil that could be running the generators for their guns. They rip up the pipes in the ground to make missiles out of them. You know, because they just never stopped fighting. And they're not doing it for freedom. They're doing it to destroy Israel and destroy the Jewish people. And, and we wouldn't stand for that for a second, right? You know, the right wing in America made an, ex, uh, an enemy out of Mexico in Trump's first campaign. Mexicans, right? The people who make this country run practically and South America, you know, and Central America, right? Immigration is what makes this country hum and it's what makes this country great. We're a country of immigrants, you know? But when, when 
when historical injustices get exploited, right? Because there's always, you know, there's two sides to every story. That's the problem. That's, that's what diplomacy is. It's really complicated stuff. And, and very smart men have been beating their heads against the wall with this conflict for my entire life, right? Jimmy Carter got peace, right? What happened? Sadat got assassinated, right? Bill Clinton got peace. What happened? Itzhak Rabin, you know, or approaching peace. We, we should never say peace, but made inroads, you know, working towards a solution, you know, doing that hard work. Then that slipped away, right? Then you had the Y River kind of thing down in Maryland where they went and had another retreat and some good came out of that. And then that slips away. And, and, and then by 9-11 happening, you know, Islamic extremism had been co-opted by straight up terrorists, right? It, and if you notice my language there, I'm not, I'm not saying Muslims or terrorists or is, Islam is a, a message of peace. You know, it's a religion of peace. I've been reading Sufi poets and Rumi and all that stuff my entire life. As I said, my grandfather, you know, lived over there. He lived in Saudi Arabia. You'd go to my grandfather's house for Sunday dinner. You, you're watching the Redskins and you're eating hum, hummus. You, you know, you're eating Middle Eastern food. You know, it's a very rich culture. Persians, you know, one of the great tragedies of my lifetime and all of ours collectively is, is you know, the Ayatollah Khomeini taking over Iran and, and, and us being, being deprived of Persian culture, which is one of the richest, you know, oldest cultures in the world. And, and we don't know that. We don't get to know all these young people that live in Iran because they're, they're kept there, you know, under, under a brutalist regime. You know, and, and that weakens us as a world because we should all be playing together. We should all be, you know, checking out each other's art and books and films and music. And then, you know, we can all be dancing under the sun on this planet. And the guys that don't want that to happen are the guys that want to keep their stranglehold on power. And that's what we're now seeing in the United States. Right. That's what Trump is offering people. That's what Project 2025 is. Right. There was a big piece that came out this week in the New York Times, you know, or it was the Post or whatever, you should go read it, but about the DOJ version of Project 2025, you know, how he wants to go after Bill Barr, you know, and, and General Milley, you know, and like John, it was the chief of staff guy, you know, the guy from Boston, John Kelly, like he wants to go after his own administration in the last term and lock them up because they didn't help him become dictator last time. So this time he's like, I'm dictator. That's it. You elect me. I am your retribution. Right. But he's not their retribution. He's his own retribution, just like Hitler was interested in his own power. He wasn't doing it on behalf of working class Germans. He was doing it because he was a freak and he wanted a bunch of, you know, other freaks to join him. So he had Goebbels and, you know, Mengele and all these fucking mutants, you know, who made, you know, cool looking uniforms if you're an asshole, right? Black and silver, you know, iron crosses and all this crazy shit that appeals to meatheads, much like MAGA, right? Much like screaming eagle tattoos and big pickup trucks and flags with an AK-47 or AR-15 on them, you know, and Confederate flags. That appeals to assholes. The kind of stuff, the iconography, as I've talked about many times, toxic iconography, you know? It appeals to the broken parts of men, right? That's always been an easy thing to exploit throughout history. And you have to watch out for that, you know? Because crafty people can, can, can use it against you. You know what I mean? They can use it against you. And, and Trump is, is, has the charisma somehow still that he has a hold over these people. And, and, and even if you want to, you know, focus on his foibles and, and all of his problems, the, the larger issue is that everyone is emulating him now, right? I watched the Republican debate this week. Nobody still wants to denounce him. You know, Chris Christie does a little bit. And I'm, obviously, I'm no fan of Christie, but he made some good points. He said some things about food stamps that they absolutely need to hear in the in the Republican Party, right? But they figured out a while ago, we're not going to beat Trump, so we have to become like Trump, 
You know, you have little Ron DeSantis saying, I'll shoot them stone cold dead at the border when they come over with fentanyl. You know, reductive, simplified problem. Fentanyl comes from China. You know, it's coming in in a shipping container with your fucking flat screen TV that you're going to rush out and buy on Black Friday, you know, in a couple of weeks and pump some more money overseas, you know, or into a big box store instead of reinvesting in things that would make you richer in the long run. Do you know what I mean? And I don't mean monetarily richer. I mean holistically richer, right? But people don't want to go down that path and they don't want the kind of politicians that want to have a cult-like hold on their followers need to control how they think and feel. And Trump has been a master of that his whole life. You know, that's why he showed up in court all last week because this is the only trial he cares about. He cares about his image you know, that he was rich. This trial was about the, you know, valuations of his properties. It, you've probably heard the John Barron thing, right? So he called up Forbes in 1984 because he wasn't on the list of like the wealthiest New Yorkers, the billionaires list or whatever. And he was like, I need to be on that list. My name's John Barron. I work for Donald Trump and he's a billionaire. You need to count his father's assets and put him on that list. Trump himself was worth $5 million at the time, right? But he put on a fake voice and was like, my dad's a billionaire, so by proxy I should be a billionaire too because he wanted that image. And he was able to create that image. And he has been a billionaire a couple times. You know, he got 700-something million from his dad's inheritance, blew that, then got a gig at NBC to be a pretend billionaire on a reality show, and NBC went along with it because there was a buck to be made. So Mark Burnett, you know, created this bullshit image that I was obviously a part of. And it fed into that mentality. You know, those women I was talking about at the airport, you know, I'm sure part of their rationale was like, well, how bad can he be? He's a billionaire. He's made all this money. And if you pay attention to these pollings, uh, the poll numbers, a lot of, when, you know, when they do these sort of, it's not exit polling because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen on election day. But when they do the sort of like the follow up questions, you know, what are the issues that are, that are driving you as a voter? It's always the economy. You know, I, I heard a lot of man on the street stuff in Wisconsin, you know, where people are starting to turn against Biden and certainly Michigan. You know, the Arab American community is going to turn on him probably. You know, they're, they're, they talk with people in the black community that are going to turn on them. And, and, you know, people have a right to, to, to have issues and be aggrieved. I'm not saying, like, your vote should be taken for granted. It, it certainly shouldn't. You know, but I will tell you, like, Biden is not, like, anti-black community. You know, go down to the White House, it, you know, his staff is diverse AF, okay? And not in a just token, let me do this for the cameras kind of way. He's legit committed to diversity. Has he been his whole life? Of course not. You know, was he a law and order guy in the early 90s? Yes, he was, as was Bill Clinton. And that was a mistake that both men will admit to today. And they're doing their best to make it better. And certainly Biden is. You know, this was, a, this was President Obama's vice president. You're telling me you're going to vote for Trump over him? Are you nuts? Are you insane? Do you, do you think you're going to be better off under Trump as an Arab American? Literally, the article came out yesterday, the follow-up to, you know, there's the Project 2025, what he's going to do to the bureaucracy. He's going to gut it and fire 500,000 federal workers on day one and replace them with Trump loyalists that have no experience, right? So you'll get a redux of Orion Zinke, who wants to ban all Palestinians from the U.S. and deport them taking back over, you know, at the de Department of Interior or something like that. You know, you'll get a Scott Pruitt part two at the EPA at a time where you've never needed the EPA more than you do now, right? So you'll have all these horrific things happen at the, at the bureaucratic level. And then you have the DOJ version of that, which I just talked about. And then you have the immigration version. And that article came out late yesterday in the New York Times, and that's being crafted by Stephen Miller, who is a Nazi. He happens to be Jewish, but his family's disowned him. I mean, the guy is, he, he's as close to what you would picture a Nazi to be like in, in temperament and intellect as anyone I've ever seen on the political spectrum in my life, right? So you have that guy who wants to deport all Muslims, 
wants to restrict immigration from certain countries, like you can't even come here. If you're already here, we're going to kick you out. So another Muslim ban, which is horrific, because Muslims are Americans and have every right to be here. You're as American as I am. That was the point I was trying to make with my Palestinian friends growing up, who I was friends with in my 20s until I moved back to New York and lost touch. You know, I grew up with people from other lands. You know, that is a blessing in this country, you know. And the way this country's sort of socioeconomic system is geared, you probably get more of those experiences if you're growing up, you know, lower down on the socioeconomic ladder than you are higher up, right? Because the higher up you go, things get a little whiter. You know what I mean? As, as we've talked about forever. And that's not to say all white people are bad or all rich people are bad. But, you know, Trump is a product of that ladder environment, right? And the people running his show are a product of that sort of like country club privilege, you know, failing upwards, getting into Harvard, even though you're a dumbass, but your dad paid for a library, Jared Kushner types, right? And that makes people less diverse, right? But it also is somehow sold as aspirational to the people in the suburbs, the white, aggrieved, resentful people who don't know why they can't get a leg up since the Reagan era on, you know, and aren't willing to, you know, see who the, the, the people are that are really screwing them over, which are the corporations and the Republicans that are trying to give tax breaks to corporations. That's who's screwing you. Biden is not screwing you. Biden is doing his best to pull this thing out of a tailspin. You know, it's a miracle we're not in worse shape right now, given what we went through in the Trump era. You know, it really is. It truly is. We should be, this should be like a dust bowl situation right now. And it's not. Unemployment is low. Unions are strong. You know, the SAG, WGA, United Auto Workers, all had victories in the last few weeks. And there's more to come. There's more contracts up. You got Biden showed up on the picket line. Trump didn't do that. Trump showed up, pretended to be on a picket line. He showed up in a non-union shop and said, don't vote for the unions. They're, they're going to screw you over. That was the same mentality I heard a lot in the 80s. You know, I, I would have these kids have arguments with me in, in keg parties in a backyard about how unions were ruining the country. You know, some kid with four Z's in his last name, whose dad laid bricks for a living, was telling me that unions, you know, were not the way to go. It's like, are you insane? You know, because if you don't have protections for workers, you end up with Elon Musk's. You end up with a guy who's running Tesla and has 600, or, you know, injuries at SpaceX and nobody does anything about it. You know, there was a great article that came out on Reuters on Friday about that, and it just blew your mind that the guy's gotten away from this, and somehow OSHA has been asleep at the wheel, and the U.S. government has given them a $15.3 billion surplus, not surplus, you know, stipend to do this stuff. Like, one dude died... They were carrying all this like foam insulation out of like a hangar and they needed to take it to another part of the SpaceX plant in Texas. And they didn't have any cables to strap it onto the back of the car. So this guy's like, I, I'll just sit on top of it while you drive there. I'll just sit in the back and sit on top of the foam. And they drive and a gust of wind comes and, you know, blows the foam and the person, the worker off of the truck and he lands on his head in concrete and dies. You know, and that's just one incidents there's like amputations like 18 people got amputated like it's insane to read all of the you know things that are befalling these workers right because there's no regulations you know that's what happened in the industrial revolution here nobody was telling the carnegies and the rockefellers and you know rockefeller was oil but you know what i'm saying you know all, all the people that jp morgan was banking you know, to, to run these factories, they didn't give a shit if some 10-year-old was in there working the machine and got his arm caught in the gears and it ripped his arm off or cut his body in half, you know? They'd get another poor kid in there. Don't, don't stop the line, you know? Johnny Cash's brother got cut in half as a kid worker, went to work at a mill, you know? Like, people get chewed up by capitalism. You know, they get chewed up by it. That's why you need unions. That's why you need a strong Democratic president, right? 
And that's why having people so misguided take to the streets to stop the bombs falling. I got no problem with that. But when you're insulting and when you're being anti-Semitic and when you're adding to the rancor, you're helping the bad guys win. You're helping the guys who are not going to hook you up, who are not going to reduce your student loan debt, you know, who are not going to mandate equality in hiring, who are not going to back unions that are going to make sure you can pursue the career you want to pursue and make a livable wage. Because all the, you know... AI and streaming platforms and Spotify's and Tesla's and Elon Musk, they want to take it all from you, right? We saw what Elon Musk did to, to Twitter. You know, I've tweeted, I lasted three days after the attacks. And, you know, I put a couple copy and paste posts from my threads to try to, you know, get people over there. But, you know, I'm not going to continue on that platform. And everybody else seems to be still doing it including the White House, you know, because it's their audience and they want to make a buck. And I get that, but you're going to get screwed in the end, and God knows what he's going to do, you know, a month before the election next year. And it's game over if Trump wins. You know, it really is. So negative partisanship, you know, that's what we're seeing in a lot of the protests, right? It's not like this is horrible, war sucks, we need to stop this. We need to figure out a solution so we can all live in peace. It's instant, you know, binary attacking the Zionists, you know, or the Israelis, or your Jewish classmates down at Penn or Cornell or wherever. Like, what is wrong with you? I saw a little blonde girl at USC who went to Wesleyan before that. <laughs> you want to talk about privileged? Ripping up posters of hostages, of people who have been sitting in a tunnel 65 feet below the earth for a month after getting snatched out of their beds on Saturday morning, seeing their families murdered in front of them, then driven off by a bunch of masked men with guns and thrown into a fucking cave. I'm getting so mad, I got like spit coming out of my mouth. You know, what is wrong with you ripping down those posters? You know, because dogma, because like internet, because I saw a TikTok video and I'm pissed and I get why you're pissed, but you, you're pissed at the victims. You know, this isn't an easy situation and this war would not be happening had Hamas not attacked on October 7th. We'd be talking about, you know, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey right now. You know, <laughs> that's what you'd be talking about on your college campus. You know, instead you're singing like, you know, protest chants that you don't even know what they mean. They mean the eradication of the Jewish people. They mean the eradication of the Israeli state. So when you come at people with that anti-Semitic shit, consider me, you know, consider me, I'm on that side. Consider me Jewish, you know what I mean? I'm not like I, I'd, I'd happily be, I just didn't grow up that way, you know, but it's something to be proud of and you've got to come through me first if you're coming after my Jewish family and our Jewish fellow citizens. And the fact that everybody's not taking that course, the fact that some are being silent, that some are using it as an opportunity to be like, yeah, see, that's what they do, is completely, not only inhumane and ignorant, it, it, it denies all the things that people would pretend to be proud of as Americans. You know, we're the good guys. We fought in World War II. We liberated the world. You're not honoring the GI in your family, you know, who died in a frozen field in Belgium somewhere at 19 years old after leaving a cornfield in Iowa. You know, you're not honoring his memory and his sacrifice by attacking your fellow Americans who are Jewish. You're not. You know, and you're certainly not honoring them by voting for a guy who's waving a flag, who wouldn't let his own family serve, who thinks of veterans as suckers and idiots because there's nothing in it for him, who got five deferments from the Vietnam War lying, saying he had bone spurs because his dad owned a fucking strip mall in Queens that had a podiatrist in it, and he shook down the podiatrist and said, I'm going to raise your rent unless you write my idiot son, you know, a 4-H deferment or whatever it's called to get out of the, the Vietnam War. I don't know what it is. I just made that 4-H thing up. But that, <laughs> that's how the deferment came. You know, it's insane. It's insane. So, 
you know, that's my rant. And, and I don't want to keep ranting at you guys. So I, so I think I'll do a few more episodes and kind of shut it down for a while. Do something else on YouTube. You know, I, I play some music. You know, I got all these songs I'm writing. We, we need art. We need art in the humanities because really you're powerless over most of this stuff. You're not powerless to vote and you're not powerless to speak out. Okay, but you, you got to be careful of where you're speaking out. This is not just click and retweet time. This is write something yourself and publish it. Put it out there. Start your own sub stack. You know, start your own podcast. You know, take to the streets in peace. In the end, peace is what wins. You know, peace. And not a Pollyannish version that ignores the complexities, right? Because when, when, when people are trying to kill you and they're willing to do stuff, like Hamas did, it's not just peace. That's You're not going to kumbaya your way out of that situation. You know what I mean? But you can change your own heart. You can open your own mind. You can educate yourself. And when you educate yourself and see the totality of the situation, you may find some light within yourself that you can expand upon. You might be able to find a frequency that hasn't been, you know, that, that been put into the conversation yet that's going to make a difference and help it all gel together. You know, like when you're mixing a concert, a mixer, you know, front of house guy, what you're doing is like every instrument in a band has, has a different place it occupies, a different frequency, right? There's numbers for these frequencies, you know, from low to high, right? So you got keys and a singer and stuff. It's at the high end. You got bass and bass drums are at the low end, you got a guitar, it's the mid, right? If you get a guitar player, he turns up the bass too much on his amp, it screws everything else up, because you don't need him to provide that frequency, that's what the bass is for, right? So you get guys who know how to dial it all in, you EQ it for the room you're in, every room is different, your amp's not going to sound the same today as it did last night in Cleveland, you know, here in Pennsylvania. So you get somebody who understands the rafters are higher here, you know, it's the floor is made out of different material. The stage is a different height. There's all these mathematical things that you take into consideration. You know, the people in the room, right? And how the sound back bounces off of them and reflects off of them. You take all of this into consideration. You get the frequencies correct, right? And it all locks together, you know? It all sort of compresses into this one thing that becomes more powerful than any individual instrument. You know, and you have harmony, you know, and then the audience gets caught up in that vibration too, and it becomes just, just this one thing. And that can change hearts, it can change minds, it can open your consciousness up in ways you hadn't thought about before, right? But you got to get in there and tweak it. You got to know where your frequencies are off, you know? So, like, too much anger, too much ranting, that's, that's my frequencies off. I'm not going to make a difference, you know? I, I've said pretty much all I have to say on Trump. I've told you everything I know. It's it's just more of the same at this point, right? It's it's regurgitating the same facts, and it doesn't matter how many people hear this stuff. You know, people know who he is at this point. They know they want to vote for him or they don't want to vote for him. What matters at this point is not having the left, you know, cannibalize itself. And that's what I'm afraid is going to happen. You know, you got the third party candidates, you got all the spoilers, you got the Koch brothers, you got whoever's funding all this insanity. You got Speaker Johnson, who tried to overthrow the election last time, right? He's the guy who wrote the sort of legal brief on how they were going to contest the votes in, in swing states. What is that going to, what is that guy going to say next time? You know, the guy who's got all his closet, you know, skeletons to hide or whatever it is you know this freak christian who flies a flag outside of his office that's like a pine tree and it's like something about heaven on it and and it's it's a flag that was co-opted by a guy named dutch sheets who's the head of a really far-right christian christian nationalist group and it's just the whole treaties of the group that is is like the america is a christian nation and that's what it was meant to be from the beginning and we have to have a sort of war to reclaim that <laughs> you know that's that's the flag that speaker johnson a guy you've never heard of before a month ago is flying outside of his office the guy who claims to not have a bank account even though you know he's 
52 years old or something. You know, he's like my age. He says he doesn't have a bank account. Dude's been an attorney. He's been a state senator. He's been a congressman. And now he's Speaker of the House. You're trying to tell me he's going to the check cash and place on Friday? <laughs> you know what I mean? He's got this freaky wife. You know, they're trying to tell people that it's, you know, homosexuality, which is just to say it like that, gay. You know, I'm using their language, but, you know, to be gay is a lifestyle choice and it's in opposition to Christianity and people can be coaxed out of it, counseled out of it, and they run a company that counsels people on stuff like that. You're trying to counsel somebody who's born that way, that they shouldn't be that way. You're trying to infer there's something wrong with being that way. There's nothing wrong with being that way. It's as natural as anything else, any other lifestyle, you know, but they're trying to get extremism into the view, just like extreme Islamics. They don't let you be gay over there either. It's against their religion, their interpretation of religion. Any religion that goes beyond love and peace is being co-opted, you know, and that's a whole nother episode. You know, at the heart of any religion is a sign that's pointing towards the truth, and that's love. That's awareness and loving your neighbor, right? You don't have to know the the whole history of everything. Be nice to people. You know, quiet your mind, trust God. Make up any God you like. As long as your God isn't telling you that somebody else is wrong because of how they're living their life, you got a good God. If you have some interpretation that you can impose your will and your ideology on somebody else, you're, you're in a cult. You're not in a religion. You're in a movement, a militarized intellectual process to subjugate other human beings. And that ain't doing anybody any good. You know, go out and look at nature. You know, they don't have a religion. The dragonflies I'm going to go look at out by the pond. You know, there's no denomination. They're alive and they're completely in the moment in their aliveness. Right? There's a presence to any animal. They're always in the moment. Watch your dog and cat. They're, they're just, what's next? What's coming? What happened right there? What is this? They're right here. You know, they're not all in their heads unless they've been abused. Right? They're, they're right here. Right in this moment. This moment's all you got. This moment is how you change things. You know? This moment is how you tap into something higher than yourself. And it's not easy to just you know, snap your fingers and be there. That's why I'm always saying, play an instrument, make a painting, write a book, you know, do crafts. Crafts are art. Don't, don't, don't fall for the arts and crafts. It's all art. If you're making something, it's art. And being creative is one of the highest things you can do as a person. And it has nothing to do with the business side of it. I'm not talking about becoming a professional comedian or actor or any of that other stuff that's hard. Not that it's hard to do the art. It's hard to get lucky enough to have a career. I'm talking about creation just for the point of creating something. Just for the point of being in the moment, being in love with a color, or trying to express something inside of you that, that you can't otherwise express. You know, follow that path and it'll lead you into awareness. It'll lead you into opening up your own heart in ways you can't imagine. And there's nothing more important you could probably do in this world at this moment when you feel paralyzed you know when you feel paralyzed with fear when you feel powerless to do anything about the horror you see on the world that you should be bearing witness to i'm not telling you to ignore it and go binge netflix right you have to bear witness limit your consumption of things you weren't meant to see because we're all seeing things now that usually you would only see if you were in a war and now we just see it in your feed on, on facebook or something it's horrific right but you can read a newspaper and stuff. You can still know what's going on. You can still learn the history of the situation. You can still listen to smart people talking about what a solution may be. And then you can channel that, that confusion, that sorrow into creating something in the moment for yourself, for this planet that didn't exist, you know. Go spend a day looking at a flower and then go home and draw the flower and then keep drawing it every day. You know, watch a bird. They'll, look, they'll tell you everything you need to hear. I told you this story before. I was at a, the UN doing some event years ago. And there was a kid who was, you know, was a young man at this point. But as a child, he was a child soldier in Sierra Leone. You know, I believe it was Sierra Leone. 
you know, he was one of these kids that, you know, the warlords, you know, snatch these kids after they kill everybody in the village and then train them to be soldiers, you know, 10, 11 years old, nine years old, smoking cigarettes with a Kalashnikov kind of deal, you know, hardcore stuff, you know, really tragic stuff. So this was a kid who had been one of those child soldiers and escaped that situation and sort of, you know, was able to undo his trauma and become a force for good in the world. I can't think of his name. This happened a long time ago. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure you could Google him and figure him out. He wrote a book or something. So he was invited to the UN and he gave this little speech and I remember talking to him after. And people, you know, he's like, people come up to me, you know, like I'm some kind of like, like I have some kind of wisdom or something now. And he goes, I don't know the truth. Go listen to the birds. The birds will tell you the truth. Everything you need to hear is already out there in nature. You know, just allow your ears to open. When this guy said that like that, I knew he was the real deal, right? And if that doesn't make sense to you, I get it. Because <laughs> some things are beyond words. There's a wisdom beyond words, right? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. You know, go out there and just be present. Sit in silence. The silence heals you. You know, the silence is, is, is it, there's strength in silence. You know what I mean? And, and now's the time we need silence. It's part of my rap at the beginning of this thing. I can't just be pumping out content because people want to hear it every week. And I'm not saying a bunch of people want to hear it, but what I was trying to say is this dynamic sort of makes you think you have to constantly be shoveling out content, right? Because the algorithms just are like more and more and more. That's not how I work as an artist, you know? I'm more like Radiohead, <laughs> you know, or Tool. Like you're only getting an album every seven years of Jackson Brown and My Hero. I'm nothing like any of those other people in terms of, you know, talent. But, you know, the painting's finished when it's finished. It's not finished when, you know, the, the followers want more content. You know, and I think a lot of people get caught up in the, you know, I got to compete with such and such and all this stuff. And, you know, that's BS. That's not getting us anywhere. You know, speak when you feel you have something to say. If you cannot improve upon the silence, don't talk. You know, see what's there in the silence. And then next time you speak, you might have something to say that somebody else hasn't thought of. And again, the frequencies will align because we're all going to need to be involved in this. You know, this is an all hands on deck moment for humanity, as I've said many times, you know, relating to the environment alone, which we can't even think about yet again, really, because we have so much warfare and catastrophe. You know, I didn't mention Ukraine in this whole hour long rant, which is perhaps going to lose their funding because Speaker Johnson doesn't want to fund it. And the government's about to shut down again in five days unless they do a stopgap spending bill, which will only kick the, you know, can down to the end of the year. But hopefully that's the solution. They're clearly not going to get an actual budget sent up to the Senate in time because there's so much infighting and chaos agents who don't want a budget. They want to keep keep it chaotic so Trump can take over and say, look what Biden did. You know, people didn't get their paychecks. The government shut down, you know. Putin's trying to wait out, you know, whatever happens in our next election, and then he'll just, you know, if America stops supporting Ukraine, he'll slaughter them. These brave people who fought gallantly for coming up on two years now, in February, you know. This is crazy, this moment we're at in history, you know. It's crazy. So, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to keep making stuff. You just, you got to adjust. And, and I think, you know, what I've done in the last, five years say, you know, it, it, it served its purpose in terms of, you know, maybe it helped me express myself. Maybe I could tell you some real stuff about, you know, Trump that you hadn't heard before, but, you know, I'm not going to just repeat the same stuff for the next year because we got to take this dude out. Okay. <laughs> you know, we got to be done with this once and for all. And that's going to be a spiritual transformation. You have to change people's hearts. You're not going to change their minds at this point. You have to change their hearts. You know, we're all one in the end. You're always fighting your brothers and sisters. You know, you just don't really learn that lesson until you get to the other side. And then you go, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know, I did it wrong. You know? Let's, let's transform while we can, you know? All those lessons you didn't learn as a kid, all that suffering, 
that's befallen your life, you can transform that at any moment. Redemption is always available to you. You know, that's the real meaning of sort of being born again. All right, it's not the dogma of whatever Southern Baptist crap they're trying to teach you. Not the Baptists are all bad, but you know what I'm saying? Coming alive, coming awake. You know, that's what the Buddha was talking about, right? And what did he say? You know, before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. Okay? So get out there. Chop wood, carry water in whatever way you can. We will survive. The world is a beautiful place. We will survive these horrors. The sun is shining. You know, there's a sunset tonight. That would be my religion. Sunsets would be my religion. Okay? Everybody would come out at the end of the day, all over the world, stop what you're doing, watch the sun go down, you know, and then check on your neighbors. Everybody good? Everybody got a safe place to sleep? Everybody got enough to eat, especially the kids? All right? Everybody good? All right, let's have a magical night under the stars. Wake up and do it again, you know, together. All right, guys. Peace. I love you. Thanks for listening. Check out the Substack, Noel Castler. Noel's Notes or whatever, noelcastler.com. You know where to find me. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. Peace.